Uh, you sent me a, a good video, Rory, about um, addiction and the very last line of the video, uh, the guy says, the opposite of addiction is not sobriety. The opposite of addiction is connection. And you said that you wanted to kind of jump off uh, with that on this episode uh, of the podcast. And I'd love nothing more, man. Yeah, cool. I, Ryan and I have talked a lot about, um, about that. That was um, a TED Talk. The video I sent you was the TED Talk by Johan Hari. Uh, and I know Ryan just, you said you read, read his last book. Yeah, it's called Lost Connections. And it's really about how depression and these other things are stemming from uh, disconnection in modern society. As we get more connected digitally, we end up getting more disconnected. Um, yeah, and so socially. So, you know, um, for people viewing this, I don't know, we talked a little bit about in the past about, you know, my drug addiction and um, Ryan's uh, disconnection from, you know, life and, and the moment and stuff. And so like Ryan and I, you know, in, in getting clean, we decided we were going to start a podcast and Ryan, I think, came up with the name, but we both kind of did it. It's called Cultivating Connections. And, and the reason like the it, if you could grossly oversimplify how recovery went for us, if you could break it down to one word, it would be connection. Like mm -hmm. before that, when we were struggling, we were disconnecting from life. When we tried to make a change, it was all about reconnecting. And it started with like reconnecting as brothers, but also reconnecting to ourselves and then reconnecting to our family, to, to our community. And it, it goes on and on, but like starting to like connect with ourselves, and I guess most of all connect with the present moment and life and just be in it was like the first step really. Hmm. You're, you're already preemptively addressing my questions. I already had one about, uh, you know, connection to what, right? I mean, connection is a relationship, right? I mean, how two things relate to one another. And mm -hmm. so when, when that guy in, in the video says the opposite of addiction is connection, I'm thinking, well, what kind of connection? There's so many kinds, right? Is it mm -hmm. uh, connection to other people? Is it, connection to the present moment and you just nailed it i mean that was the first step for you guys right yeah, yeah. And, and i think another good point to make is like it's a good question is connection to other people yeah of course you know connection to the moment 100 percent. connection to ourselves is something that i didn't ever uh give a give enough credence to because i didn't want to you know i wanted i didn't want to face myself and my fears and my discomfort and everything that comes with life. Um, so I think to dig it deeper, it's ultimately it's a connection to ourselves because, you know, the people around us are just, are just examples of us in a way. Like we all reflect each other. Yeah. yeah it starts with ourselves and uh, it's hard to have constructive relationships with, with people outside of yourself. If you don't have a healthy relationship with yourself, and vice versa. So like, uh, I think connecting with Rory really helped me in connecting with myself again, you know, finding some acceptance from him helped me accept myself. Hmm. You're nailing it, guys. I mean, yeah. So basically, you know, if, if I may ask, do you think that it's hard for people to be present, specifically because it's hard for them to be alone with themselves? Like, was that your experience? Like, it's hard to be in the That's, moment because when you're in the moment, you're just with yourself. You got nowhere to turn, no distractions, nothing. It's just you and you. <laughs> and if you don't have a relationship with yourself, that's going to be an awkward moment, right? Yeah. I could give you an example, even like in my own life, like even to this day, it's not like, you know, I've more connected with myself and everything's easier or better. You know, it, it's, it's, it's a false hope to say that. Um, but like, I'll be in the same room as anyone even if i know them like even my mom for example i'll be in the same room and i'll if it's silent i have this anxiety building from within and just the more silence goes on the uh, stronger the anxiety builds um and so that's something that i'm working on you know i've actually in the past couple months i've been talking to my mom more and 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 dissolving those like uncomfortable anxious like boundaries between us but like for example if i meet someone new and i don't uh, I don't really know them and we're in a room and it's quiet. Like I'm in my head the entire time. I'm just kind of 
tell myself whatever just to get through the moment, um, which isn't being mindful. It's the opposite of being mindful, I guess. You know, it's being in your mind as, as opposed to being present. Bruce, you've said before that, like, the hardest part, like, harder than getting off the drugs is being present with yourself in the moment in your room yeah. alone, even after the drugs are gone. Just, yeah. Get, and, yeah, which is, is, you know, quite a statement. I mean, getting off opiates, you know, I was on opiates for seven seven years, methadone, 10 years, heroin, but getting off them was extremely difficult. But uh, to this day, the hardest thing that I've ever had to do is just kind of, just kind of like, like we're talking about, just, you know, be alone and accepting and okay with it. Because I don't know if it's the monkey mind or if it's just human, humans in general, but from my experience, I don't want to do that at any cost. Like that's the whole thing about disconnection. Whatever I can do to disconnect from, from doing that uh, in the past, I mean, I went to heroin, I did crazy other things, you know, whatever it took, really. Yeah, mm -hmm. really, that really was the biggest lesson that I got from my first psychedelic experience, because the five days after it, worst anxiety of my life, and all I want to do is disconnect, but this one intuitive feeling saying, just sit with this, you know, mm -hmm. and I think over time, that lesson has, I've had to relearn it over and over and over again. And I think I'm relearning it right now. And mindfulness for me is, it, it, I realize it's a way to take what we do on our Sundays and bring it into every aspect of our life, you know, into like literally every moment where we can be present and, and grateful and, and experiencing. Like if you're not present in the moment, you're not experiencing life. And that's really what we're here to do, I'd say. Yeah, well, I would agree. But um, as you called it, Rory, the monkey mind is really good at distracting. And um, like I tell people, it's a problem solving tool. And in the absence of a problem, it'll start making some fucking problems up for you. Because if it's yeah, exactly. something to do, it's just like, well, let's talk about grade three when that guy pants you or whatever, you know, like, it'll just pull up random shit, because it's like, yeah. I need something to do. And exactly learning to quiet the mind and, and bring bring it to stillness is, uh, I mean, I think that's why meditation is such a powerful first step for most people is because it's the first time they ever shut that mind up for any period of time and realize, Oh man, it's right. It's way nicer in here when the roommate's not, bleep, 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 <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's really tough to do because uh, I think like that problem solving mind is always like telling yourself you could be using your time more efficiently, like more effectively. Like if I was working to make money, it'd be better if mm. I was, you know, doing this, but in reality, like, the most, the most valuable time really that I can think of is just being still present and just acknowledging everything that comes up, accepting it, letting it go. Cause if you don't do that, that stuff just ruminates and comes out in habitual patterns that are not constructive. And sorry, I think one of the hardest things like um, about that mindfulness, I think is after, if you haven't been mindful for a long time, like you consistently distract yourself for long periods of time, when you first start to be mindful, it's very hard because all of the things that you've been escaping are the first things that come up. And I think that's <laughs> usually anxiety, fears, yeah. insecurities, so, and it hits you, you know, hard. And it's like, I just want to escape from this. Yeah. And, and, and not to segue, but I, I think talking, I know, I, I think you have some interest in psychedelics. I mean, you've asked us about it. We clearly do. And I guess what I was going to say is like the psilocybin, for example, like I, so I was, so I did the technique of like taking a high heroic dose a five gram dose and sitting in my bed with the lights off and silence. And like, to me, I'm not saying there's not other ways to get there, but, um, and I'm not promoting psychedelics either. I'm not promoting psilocybin. I'm saying that from my experience, that was the quickest and surefirest way to, because I wasn't allowing myself to, um, to, to feel those things without substances. I mean, I, I'd probably have to sit in a room for seven days straight just to get there, you know, because yeah. I'm so, I'm, I'm so good at deflecting like those, those thoughts. So anyways, my point is like, yeah, I did this dose and um, the entire time it was, it wasn't that they were just in my face or in my head. They were like in my eyeballs. I was like seeing it. I was like, was, like being shown it through like images and, so, I mean, I don't know what, what, how much that's worth in the grand scheme of things, but I know that that's ha what happened to me. <laughs> I mean, I think it's worth a lot, but it, it's like, that's like, you know, jumping in the pool, whereas as opposed to like mindfulness meditations, like slowly walking into it, you know, and <laughs> yeah. 
and if you jump in the pool and you're not ready, you know, you could drown, you know what I'm saying? But I think there it's good uh, distinction to bring up. And, and like, I, I really didn't find the value of meditation until after mm. really after this last most recent dose I did, because I don't know why I didn't, because I always knew it like scientifically proven that meditation mindfulness is helpful for your brain, helpful for your physiology and, and wellness, but I just couldn't commit to doing it until, you know, the past couple of weeks I've, you know, started to develop a practice that's been pretty consistent for like the first time in a, my whole life. And not only is it consistent, I'm seeing the value of it uh, in the moment, like as it's happening, seeing the value right there. And it's really been a blessing for me because it's like I said, it's a way to take all the, these past experiences, these psychedelic experiences, this, these Sunday rituals that we have, take it all and, you know, integrate it into every moment that I'm alive. Yeah, that's the goal, right? I mean, when you pick up something, whether it's through a psychedelic experience, mystical experience, reading a book, the whole point is if you don't use it, you lose it, right? So integrating it and making use of it in your daily life is the whole point. You know, I never really understood people who study religious texts and then don't actually apply any of it. You know, if you're going to be, you know, reading the Bible, like find some shit in there that you can use and use it, right? Embody it. Right. Um, yeah. And yeah. there's a lot of good, and there's a lot of good stuff in there. hundred I mean, percent. There is. There's I good stuff I, in all of them. I never like read it. <laughs> like, I'll, be the, I'll be the first to admit it. Like, but I, well, I mean, I know I've read different scripture and I like under, I know some of the gist of it. I obviously could go deeper into it, but I know for a fact there's good stuff in that. I mean, who am I to say there isn't, but mm -hmm. there are people like he knew, like, you know, new age, modern day, like people are pushing away religion and would say, Oh, you know, just write it off like it's it's whatever. But I mean, like yeah. it's a fairy tale. I guess, mm. yeah. Which I kind of did for a while because I was told this and I was told that, and it's like, all right, well, let me experience it for myself. Don't don't try and tell me, you know. Well, that's I mean, part of life. as the old yeah. adage goes, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You know, hundred percent. There's valuable valuable lessons in in really all all historical texts, especially ones that have a, such a massive influence. There's not a more influential book ever written <laughs> but yeah, i can't it, deny that there's something there yeah i think what you were saying earlier about like studying versus uh like embodying it in your life is like that's kind of the diff the distinction i make between uh like experiential knowledge and just intellectual knowledge Absolutely. i know like growing up i wanted to read read these books that were just full of facts so i could just spit these facts out to other people and make myself look really smart it, it worked if you were like wow how do you know that it's like i'm just i'm not really i don't know any of this stuff i'm just like memorizing you know one-liners and uh i never really liked reading because of that because it always felt like a chore but now i've been reading just like for enjoyment you know I started like reading some fiction and it's way more valuable, way more tangible in your life when it's meaningful to you and it, you're enjoying it. And like these things that seemingly, I mean, it's not like just, just random stories, random stories that have mythological um, underpinnings in them that uh, highlight things going on in your life and, and make you allow you to connect to what's going on and in, uh, in your life, but also like in the entire human experience. Yeah. Well, and if you were, I mean, you went to university or college or whatever, so you were doing a lot of reading that probably wasn't meaningful. It was just forced on you. And that was my experience of university. I mean, I dropped out of it twice because I hated it so much because it's like, I don't, I don't want to read what you're telling me to read. I want to learn about this cool stuff. Right. And um, yeah, it's interesting after I left university and got into philosophy and stuff on my own, instead of through an academic um, setting, then I found value in it. And then it became this huge part of my life that's you know, ongoing. So yeah, I totally get that. Forcing yeah. people to read these old books is not the way to go. It has to, has to grab you or it has to interest you somehow. That's one thing I really noticed in, uh, in college, but also in the um, younger schools too, like uh, elementary school, like I, I didn't want to read what people told me to read. But if you like, if I was exposed to like all these books or all these like stories and it was like, you can do whatever you want with this. You don't have to do anything. I think I would have been more inclined to, to look into it, you know? Yeah. And well, on the framing too, like if, like my, my experiences in university were terrible because the professors were just shit. And the way that they framed the topics that they were teaching was like, 
why is this relevant? It was disconnected yeah. from reality, right? It was all theoretical, all abstract. And now that I'm, you know, studying psychology and philosophy on my own, I'm like, dude, you could have just hooked me like right there. Yeah. But this guy it, comes in and he doesn't know what he's talking about, you know? So it brings up the question, the question of like how things are taught because the, it's one teacher teaching it. It's it, it, no, no matter, no matter what way you cut it, it's going to have something, there's going to be some personal link to what they are teaching to people. And maybe you don't agree with this one teacher. So like Ryan and I were just like, throwing ideas around one time we're like it'd be kind of cool if there was two teachers that way you get i don't know that way you at least get some diversification at least some in the way that it's being taught yeah i don't know it was just like an i like we just talked about it but it, it does it just brings up a question like how what know, else are you getting with the information you're getting it's filtered through the lens of right. this of one person. of one person and sometimes that can be sometimes that can be great you yeah. know if they're very good educators and you can see the meaning it has in their life and you can realize, oh, that's, there's something to that. But then but other if, times, they've, if they've been closed off or, or not had similar experiences to us, it's going to be very hard to relate. Yeah. Or if they're just, you know, getting their paycheck, it's just a job to them. You know? <laughs> yeah. Many of them are that way. Right. I mean, yeah. yeah I mean, that education is, is something that is neglected by, I think, all governments. It's like the, you know, the military, uh, you know, bailing out banks. And then it's like, oh, let's throw a couple bucks at education. I mean, it'd be great if they would have two teachers per class. That would make the most sense to me. I mean, yeah. yeah. But but they're like, oh, we can't afford that. <laughs> Spend even some more just, trillions on the war, you know? But even just, yeah, exactly. Even just having one other teacher, it's not just going to be, it's not like, oh, you're just adding another another lens. You're, you're diversifying it to the point where this person has had a completely different experience than this person. I'm, you're assuming, I mm -hmm. mean, most people do like even my brother and I don't have the same experiences and that brings in like so many more factors than just one lens and one lens telling you it because because then they have to like talk I don't know it just to me it seems like it, it's a hypothesis hypothesis but or whatever hypothesis but like it could be interesting I think it would be yeah. cool to look into yeah I think so too and you know just to bring it back to the topic at hand what do you think is the role of, of public education in schools in terms of either connecting or disconnecting us in different ways? Like well, what were I'm, your guys' experiences in school? Did you feel more connected in school? And then when you got out, you were like, what the fuck? Or was it the other way around? Or, you know, like, how was it for you guys? Um, well, it, just, yeah. I think, you know, for me, there was a, a core group of friends that I met in, in high school. I mean, I kind of had a core group all the way up through my uh, school and those were like the closest people I had in my life. And I even remember distinctly thinking in high school, like I'll never be closer to a group of people ever again. And as I left that and went to college, it was like starting over from square one. And I, I hated college. I could not make any friends because I couldn't, it just was like something I, I hadn't really experienced. Cause when I was in high school, it was completely different. It was just different. You know, like I knew these people, I developed a relationship over time and now you go into college and it's like, never seen these people before and I, I just I was lost and uh I mean I still still the friends I had in high school are the probably the closest relationships I've I'll have uh I mean aside from my family but um I think there's something really amazing about like going through many going through like your coming of age with a group of people. And that's really what it is. Like as you're becoming an adult and an independent person, you're developing, you're transforming with these peers and the relationship you forge in that it's, it's kind of like, you know, uh, a military boot camp in a way, like mm. you're, you're doing these incredible things, developing like those bonds will never be broken. And uh, I don't, th I think like that school, school serves an amazing function in that, but I don't think that's the only way to do it. I think it's just the only way that's really, that we really see much of in our society because school is, is like the most uh, like uh, consistent thing we have from young age to adulthood. But I think yeah. like that, that is like a, a thing that you'd see in ancient tribes, you know, like this peer group comes of age, becomes like the leaders of the, the tribe eventually after like many years. And I think there's something to that. Yeah, I do too. I think there's definitely something to like a core group of people that you not not only in school and then after you go to college you have to break away from that and then there's something about the way that college is set up it's cool i don't know um i have a different experience like i was bullied a lot like when i was younger even though 
you know, I was just kind of like in weird ways when I was really young. And so I never really, so I was automatically withdrawn from school, like 99.9%. I mean, there was, I was still there. I was still doing some work, but like from the get go, I was just like scared, like just to be there, just intimidated. And, uh, and then in like middle school, I started to make some friends. And then in high school, I made friends too. But, but then like, I still always had that, like, part of me that was like I don't I don't enjoy this like this isn't they're not making this enjoyable for me I, mm-hmm. I'm supposed to be here supposed to be learning stuff and they're not only allowing bullying going on but they're not even looking into it at all and and mm-hmm. um, so like in high school I, de- I had a lot more friends but I still had this thing of like a, d- a disconnection really when we come right down to it I was so disconnected from the school and from even like my close friends I was there was like two friends out of like 20 or 30 I had friends but only like two that I really connected with and even then there was a disconnect so like I don't know I I have a different experience Mm -hmm. than Ryan when it comes to schools it brings up an interesting thing because uh I agree like I I developed that connection with the my group but it wasn't because of anything that the school was doing it was was just because the opportunity was there and actually I Mm -hmm. I think now like what we were seeking in deeper connection and this ritualized experiences, I think was came out in partying and right. like drug culture of like every weekend this, we'd get a, we'd find an open house, get, you know, alcohol, some drugs and just go out and party. And like, that was like the, it, it reminds me of like a ritual, you know, like coming out, uh, getting disinhibited, getting together and just like, having a mystical type experience with everyone dancing music, yeah. just like losing your inhibitions, losing yourself. Yeah. And, and that, that's like, honestly, like, that's like what we lived for really. Yeah, well, cause like you're in the kind of, I mean, I've been in a situation like that. Yeah. I didn't seem like I had trouble in school and stuff, but I've definitely been in that party setting a lot, you know, but when you're in a setting like that, there's a, there's a, um, there's like a, a vibe to it or like a yes yeah, like a collective it's got its own like energy source oh it's yeah not like it's not like oh i'm here so it's so i'm it's important. interesting it's, it's like, like there's a collective you're kind of like letting go of your own and becoming part of this bigger type of consciousness and then and then and then you're like really in a flow state at that point yeah. which is like what i think humans really like look for in, in mm-hmm. life and they thrive off that, so yeah. so there is importance to it you know what i'm saying like yeah we're trying to get away from drugs but there is something important to it's not even the drugs really it's it's the ritual it's the yeah, it's together. connecting it's the, it's the and it's interesting because like that at first becomes super connecting and i remember the first time i i, I remember the first time I, had a, I went to a party first time i drank i only had like half a beer but i was in it and it it was like more brought on by the uh context than it was by the the substance and this experience of like uh just like community and and really like kind of ecstasy like just in the moment just loving it but the longer that went you know from the time i was 16 to the time i was you know 21 the more it became about disconnecting from my life my normal life and just kind of like losing just losing touch yeah mm-hmm. like just what, just, what, just what, not caring like going into this state and just like not caring about anything because it's just like that's how i like you know, take, take the weight off, like yeah, all the stress. Yeah. All the stresses of society all of a sudden become negligible when you're drunk and doing something like that. So like initially a thing that was trying to connect us became this destructive thing in my life. And uh, it's ironic, but it, it's cool. I mean, it's an interesting thing to learn from. I never thought about that before ever, but just talking about it right now, I started getting a little bit of excitement, you know, from thinking about like 19, 20, 21, Friday night, got the boys, got some, got some tablets, you know, let's go, right? Party time. And you're absolutely yeah. right, man. It's such a group ritual for guys. And it's like the nightclub, right? Or the party or whatever it is. Yeah. And uh, I never thought about that. But yeah, I mean, there's got to be, uh, let's call it a more constructive way to gain the benefits of those types of rituals without having to pop ecstasy and drink copious amounts of liquor and go sweat on the dance floor for, you know, hours and hours. Right. So, uh, but I don't think there's anything wrong with that as a young person going through those. I think those are the, the coming of age rituals of our modern day society. And, you know, yeah. Sadly, I mean, it's not you know the most glamorous, uh, you know, initiation into the world of adulthood, but 
it certainly uh, bonds people together. Absolutely, man. The, the crew that I ran with, we're still, we're still friends. And, you know, like every weekend, man, we were hitting it. So yeah, I never thought about that. That's a very good point. Yeah. And I, like, I don't think there's anything wrong with that either. I think it's, it was a valuable experience in my life, but now I, I think, you know, there's ways that we could kind of get back to that, rebuild that and do it in a way that's, potentially more constructive or less destructive, whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Now, Rory, you mentioned flow states, and I think that's a a good, a good um, uh, connection, if you will. We were talking about being present. And I think Mm -hmm. one of the uh, sort of hallmarks of a flow state is this loss of time, right? Like if you're doing something, like say you're a painter, you know, you're like, holy shit, it's, you know, 10 o'clock. What the hell happened? Mm -hmm. The, The self disappears, time disappears. It just becomes like you become one with whatever you're doing. And so that's, that is presence in itself as well. And so like, aside from this ritual, have you guys started finding things, activities that you find are very um, successful at inducing flow states for you guys? Uh, still looking, man. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's so cool to, that you just said that because it's, it's really cool to think like we have the ability to lose time or at least for in the moment as long as we're in, with our sober mind too, we don't have to be on, you know, I like when I played hockey, for example, or yeah. Ryan too, like I was, I used to just be like, this is it. This is mm. what I'm looking for. Um, so it, it, yeah. So you're probably the one to talk to about like how to do that. Um, Cause it seems like you, you know, you study, I don't know the, with what you study and what I've seen from you, it seems like you would um, know, but more like Sunday, definitely, obviously the, in the ritual, but um, I would say, I was, I would say sports definitely. Yeah. But yeah. since, since getting out of high school, I don't really play sports as much. Um, I guess I can sometimes get there with writing. I, mm-hmm. I write, I try to write every day. And if I'm like in the right setting and I like touch upon an emotion and just go deep into it, I can, I can really, it can becomes effortless in a way, you know, the way. Uh, I, yeah. I get it with music, but I, I don't think that's as constructive. I mean, it, it could be, but I don't think it, you know, I, um, I think it's perfectly constructive. Yeah. Yeah. I think the, the fact that you're questioning whether it's constructive or not is, uh, is besides the point, my friend, I think that yeah. if, if you enjoy it and it brings you satisfaction, you should fucking do it. And that's the key, yeah. you know, Oh, like it doesn't make me money. Right. Like you were saying earlier, I should be using my time to make money, make, you know, you can, be miserable while making money or you can uh, make zero dollars, but spend two hours doing something that just makes you feel blissed out and, and connected. Mm. Right. Because those are the mm. things that connect you. I mean, yeah. Writing for me is, is similar. I, I can lose myself in writing and like, yeah, because, because I'm not around anymore because I'm not here anymore. There's no separation anymore. I be, like everything just flows together. Right. Like you said, I mean, that's why they probably call it a flow state, but um, so yeah, anything, I mean, music. So like you, you play music or you, uh, spin no, just, music or. Uh, yeah. I just spin it. <laughs> I nice. love listening to music. Yeah, I don't that's spin awesome. it. I'm not like a, not like a DJ, but, right. uh, we do do a little radio show uh, every Monday and that's fun. You know, I just, I really like, I don't necessarily have to be the artist, but I can still express my stuff through music to other people or, um, to myself. Yeah. yeah I think me. I think music can highlight or emphasize uh, certain states of consciousness. Like I, I put on music when I meditate a lot of times, certain music that's like, uh, I don't know, helps me get into that. Also, I would say uh, re- certain times reading like a, a good book, you can get lost in it. And that's, oh, yeah, that's a great, sure. great yeah. experience. Uh, another one I'll say is um, spending time with, you know, good people, good friends. Like it's hard to do because, um, especially right now with coronavirus and, and the times, but yeah, like I'll tell you this, I, my brother and I do the cultivating connections, but I did this, I did the separate YouTube channel called our collective journey. And what I did was I would post things on the internet and people would reply and be like, Oh, I I can relate. Or I have a similar story and kind of like what we're doing right here. I would, you know, get on, talk with them and just, no no certain direction just kind of kind of like what we're doing just that that gets me like connection with people talking to people and relating that is probably the number one thing to get into a flow state for me because then it's not like oh i'm on my own listening to music i'm you know i can feel what you're portraying and 
hopefully you can feel what I'm portraying. And so there's a collective like um, flow state or co collective energy. Yeah. Yeah. I know exactly what you mean, man. I have, uh, well, like this conversation right now is a great example, but I have a, a buddy that I meet with every Monday virtually and uh, we're reading the Tao Te Ching. So we just like read three verses and then we talk about it or whatever. And I, I don't have any thoughts for that whole hour and a half that we're hanging out. My mind doesn't, there's, I'm talking, we're having this like really deep engaged conversation, but I don't have any thoughts. I'm not thinking like, well, he's talking, I'm not thinking like, okay, what am I going to say next? Or, oh, I got a good point. It just flows. Right. And that's what I'm, that's what you're talking about too. It sounds like. So, you know, again, you didn't really ask for my advice, but you're like, maybe I should be the one to tell you, or, or maybe I might have some insights for you. My insight is follow whatever fills your bucket. And just keep keep following it and it'll lead you to something else. And you know, like so maybe music isn't the thing, but if you keep engaging with it, it might lead you to the thing, or it might lead you to something else that leads you to the thing, right? If these types of conversations do it for you, just do it. Do keep doing it and magical things will happen, my friend. I guarantee it. Oh yeah. I mean, think magical things have already happened since I've yeah. tried to do it, you know? Yeah, for sure. It yeah. seems like it. Yeah. Things are moving. Right. And I mean, it's just from you guys getting in alignment with your own truth and, and then just living it or, you know, again, doing your best to live it. I think that's yeah. nobody lives at a hundred percent of the time that I know, but if you're making a concerted effort every day to live it and you're putting it like right here, like this is it, you know, you're doing it. You're doing the best thing that anybody can. So kudos to you <laughs> yeah thanks man i think it, i think it sometimes gets hard as uh uh when we're not mindful we're thinking of possibly about like where could this go you know expectations for the future mm -hmm. and that was that's what will drive you crazy you know like having all these ideas of how the future is going to go and then you feel like oh anxious to do something in this present moment it takes you out of the present and you want to continuously you know do something do something and I'm trying to learn to just like let the future be, you know, whatever comes up is going to be amazing. It'll be all new possibilities, but all I have to do is just focus on this moment right now and let that sort itself out. And that's hard for me. It's hard for most of us. Yeah. It's hard for me too. Yeah. We've been conditioned, I think, to believe that we have more control over our lives and over the world than we actually do. Right. And that's why we get fixated. And I think that's one of the reasons for anxiety is people are wanting to control something that they can't. And so there's just this like obsession with it. It's like you get stuck on it. But when you realize that you have virtually no control over anything outside of yourself and then within yourself, you have very limited control. I mean, you know, then you can focus on those things that you can control and not worry so much about the shit that's out there, like the future or, you know, whatever. Yeah. Right. So, but it's, again, that's a constant daily reminder. Every time you catch yourself time traveling, every time you catch yourself thinking about, well, was the channel going to get big? What should we do with it? It's like, you got to bring yourself back to that present moment every freaking time. And that's, that's the <laughs> yeah. hardest work there is, man. Yeah. Becoming, becoming conscious of it and just continuously becoming conscious of it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and absolutely. the more, the more mindful you become, the more you realize it. So it's like it, the work kind of gets harder. It gets harder, but it also gets more effortless in a, in a certain, in a different type of way, but mm -hmm. you become more, uh, yeah, more aware of when you're, going at somewhere else you know and bring yourself back um yeah and then like expectations is huge too because if our expectations are like you were just saying like you're the channel growing it's like yeah that's what we want too you know um we want to spread our messages to everyone because it's I, we think it's valuable um but the expectations that other people are gonna like a lot of people are gonna see it like i always like i want people to hear this i want people to know this and it's like it, it's expectations on every front it's not just that it's you know expectations of myself expectations of my brother expectations of my parents expectations of yeah so you paint a world in the future and then there's no way that actual reality ends up perfectly like that so then you're questioning and, and you know comparing and it just continues to take you out of the, that moment control is a huge it's a huge thing like the really when you're talking about that i was thinking like the only thing we really have control over is like our awareness maybe and we don't even have full control over that, but like our attention to where we put things, like I have the control to bring my awareness back to my breath. Yeah. And that is incredibly powerful in itself. I just have to like realize how powerful that is. Like mm -hmm. the breath, unbelievable power in it. And 
like if we were talking about school systems, like that's, that was the, be the first thing I would teach kids in, you know, young age, like the breath, your awareness, these are the ultimate tools you have, you know, these are like your superpower in a way. Like if you, you can become incredibly mindful, like the Buddhist monks or something, like mm-hmm. you are unstoppable. Your resilience is like mm-hmm. incredibly high. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty crazy that they don't teach any of that stuff in school, but yeah, yeah it's, um, and, and you know, you, you mentioned the breath and I think that's a really good point because, you know, a lot of people think that in order to meditate, you have to be sitting cross-legged on a cushion in front of a Buddha statue or something. Right. And it's like, you can meditate while you're driving. You can meditate while you're at the grocery store. All you need to do is redirect your attention to your breath. That's it. And take again. And it's funny to me, right? Like as a kid, did your parents ever tell you when you were getting angry, just take 10 deep breaths and you're like, fuck off mom, you know, right. Or whatever. But it's like, they were trying to tell us they might not have known fully, but it's like, yeah. yeah, of course, if you take 10 deep breaths and focus on your breathing, when you're angry after the 10th breath, you will not be as angry as before. You might not even be angry at all after, but yeah. it, they don't explain it to you. They just go take 10 deep breaths or whatever. And it's like, well, no, explain it to us, right? Break it down. Why is that uh, effective? And why is that a good thing? Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, anyways, it's almost like as a kid, we don't want to we don't want to let go of that anger. Exactly. We want to be angry. I was just going to say, because we're like, this is important to be angry. Yeah. You know? It's not, I could imagine myself try, doing the 10 breaths because somebody told me to, but just being mad that I'm doing the 10 breaths, <laughs> <laughs> you know, be mad at just everything. Defeats the purpose. Well, okay. So here, let's talk about this. This is something that we probably have in common. What, what's your relationship with anger? What was it like before? What is it like now? Has it changed since all of these momentous events have uh, occurred in your lives or what's the deal? You want to take that one? Yeah. I think you've got a, a more intimate relationship with anger. <laughs> Baby. I mean, I, it was my favorite I mean, drug for a long time. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Such a primal drug. Oh, Such yeah. A, uh, well, I mean, I, I don't know. Yeah, totally. I think my capacity for allowing myself to, I don't know, <laughs> put me on the spot. I, Sorry, man. I, uh, no, it's all good. It's all good. I, uh, I used to get super angry. I still do, but not really as explosive as I used to be. I mean, the most angry I've ever used... seen you is when you were coming off of the methadone and you didn't have other coping mechanisms to deal with the emotions. Cause with, you know, the heroin, the opiates that that was used to mitigate the anger. And it, it's trick. It's tricky. Cause I, thinking back, I don't remember being angry, but that's probably the whole trick of the anger is like not even recognizing it that's like the 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 drug so to speak the the drug part of the anger the anger being a drug you're like feeling something but you don't know it's i mean i didn't know it was anger but i felt you know a lot of things i don't know but yeah so yeah i mean uh i've like it was tough man you were you were really angry but I realized, you know, that that was just like stuff that had been buried for 10 years, you know, not allowing it to come out. And it's like, all of a sudden, it's like, you need to release that. It's Mm -hmm. that cathartic like expression Mm -hmm. and uh, it's valuable. Um, I think, I think like the, the trick is like to recognize the anger, feel it without acting on it, you know? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of, I think that's the step, you know, we're at now is like, I, I recognize when I'm anger, angry or, um, or just irritated. Like sometimes I get really irritable and it's like, I want to, I want to say something that'll like express my irritability and also make someone else irritable too. And it's like recognizing that and then just being like, taking a breath and being like, okay, I recognize it, accept, let it go. Don't perpetuate it. That's, that's the hard part, but okay. <laughs> no, I, I, <laughs> you got I that, see Rory? it. I, I know, right? I see it. I, I seen that in Ryan my entire life. He's been so much better at managing like anger, I guess, and, and all that stuff. And so like, I look up to him for that, you know, because I um, definitely haven't been good. I remember when I was young, I was got angry all the time. And um, but getting sober has given me the ability to do exactly what he just said, notice it. And I'm not not perfect, but much, much much better than i used to be yeah i can allow even if it's like i really like we were just talking about this earlier it's like what if you know something like intuition intuition like intuitively and 
you and you, you're you still just have to accept it even though you know the, the situation's wrong it's like that's a good example of something that would get me really angry especially if it's something in the family or emotionally um but yeah I, I, I would say an emotion that i have an intimate relationship with is like shame mm-hmm. and when you were saying that it's like i i feel like i have a pretty good sense of my intuition but knowing that my intuition is telling is kind of like urging me one way but my brain is telling me to do this you know and then i do what my brain says i feel shame for doing that because like mm-hmm. i trust my intuition and i want to do what it, it, it's kind of like just follow that path but a part of me wants to maybe it's just disconnect and just do something my, my own way maybe it's just to learn a lesson you know but uh i feel like when i don't when i don't act on my intuition when i don't trust it i feel shame and i feel guilt uh mm-hmm. What, what about you, Ollie? I'm curious. Uh, uh, you're, what you were just, just like... saying about uh, your intuition, Ryan, is I was just talking to a friend of mine. She's 71 now. And she was like, it only took me 71 years to trust my intuition. I was like, <laughs> cool. So, yeah, don't, you know. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, sorry, you were asking, Rory, what were you saying? Well, I'm just curious, like, what your relationship to anger is um, and how you, what you've been able to do to manage it. Yeah, it's my relationship with anger is a long and storied one. Like you, I was when I was a kid in elementary school, anger was my superpower. It's like you couldn't fuck with me. I would just flip my lid and I'd go nuts, like flip a desk, <laughs> you know, trying to pick a fight with a teacher in like grade school. Right. Mm-hmm. So it was it was like hulking up for me. And so, you know, I always as a young person viewed my anger as a, a positive thing. Because again, like I said, it, you know, if I was afraid, I'd get angry, not afraid anymore, right? If I was embarrassed, mm-hmm. get angry, not embarrassed anymore. Um, and then people are like, holy shit, this guy's crazy, right? So now I've got like this <laughs> feeling of like, yeah, you don't fuck with me or whatever. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so I mean, for me, it was like this thing that I thought was no problem at all. I was like, hell yeah, I've got a temper and I'll flip my lid uh, at a moment's notice if I want to, because that's, uh, that's what I do. But uh, over time, it, it changed, and uh, obviously, <laughs> and yeah. So I, I mean, think for me, sorry, go ahead. Uh, I was, I, I was going to say. I mean, it seems that way. Like you have three kids, you must have a handful of of emotions and things that you deal with like all the time. And you're, yeah, I, you seem so well spoken. Like it seems like you you got some things figured out. So I'm I'm looking to you, man. What do I? Oh Jesus, yeah, no. <laughs> One, the only thing I figured out is that I haven't figured it out, and that was probably the most important lesson in my life about eight years ago when I had this like blowout experience. It was like, holy shit, I don't know anything. <laughs> I thought I had it all sorted out, and it's all bullshit. Um, <laughs> but yeah, my relationship to anger changed when I realized, um, in my experience again, when I realized that anger is poison. It's like, oh, it has absolutely no use. It's only negative. Like no situation is ever improved by me being angry, ever. I, mean, I can't think of a single situation in my life where being angry has served me well. So as soon as that kind of hit and I it realized it, like again, not just intellectually, but uh, I right. felt the truth of it, managing anger became a lot easier because now every time I feel irritate, you know, irritation, frustration, or, or full-blown anger, it's like a huge alarm bell for me because it's like, why am I poisoning myself, right? Dude, that's great. That's so good. I, uh, I still get mad. Start... <laughs> I'm not perfect, but it's a lot easier. I actually remember, I think I re- remember, I don't know if I got in a fight with my parents or I was feeling some type of way about them. And that was in this, in our Sunday session, which we've talked about in the past. And mm-hmm. I can remember almost the moment that I, we were in the, in the, um, ritual doing our thing and we we're staying silent and I was thinking about my parents and how I don't know it, it, it's not like a logical thing I was just thinking about them and how you know they're trying their absolute best to not they don't want to make me angry just because I'm getting angry it's not them it's 100% me like we tried to do this breathing thing with my mom one time and she got up in the middle of it and like looked around a bit and then afterwards I waited till after the whole thing I go oh you can tell mom was pretty anxious it's like like that's all me it's nothing to do with her whether she was anxious or not doesn't it doesn't even matter like why do I have to say my part just because if I don't then I'm not I don't feel valid or something like why do I have to even do that um but like being in that setting and feeling that it now I can I can go back to it every time I'm about to get angry and be like wait I like kind of what you were saying you can you can you know it's coming and you're just like this is poison poison um I'm I there are times where I still get mad but like the way I am now, as opposed to what I used to be, like, yeah, 
like I'll even say it for myself. And I, I think I'm a lot much better at noticing when I'm getting really, you know, uh, absolutely. When I'm about to blow my lid, as you said, <laughs> like, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm, I can do that. <laughs> Yeah. And it's, again, if it's something that you're used to doing or you, you have a history of doing it, right? Like I did, I had this big pattern, right? And it was like, well, it's comfortable. It works. It works out in my favor most of the time. But then uh, what, what I noticed too, is that the, in time I started to feel a lot of shame after I would have anger because I would get angry and I would say some shit, hurt some people's feelings and, uh, or even destroy relationships that, you know, have never recovered. And then afterwards you're like, oh shit, I'm, I'm a, I'm a dick. Like I'm not a nice guy. Right. And then you feel ashamed. And so, yeah, it just reinforces that, that spiral. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think acknowledging and realizing that it's poison was for me the, the first step anyways. And then again, breathing is a great way to sometimes breathing and laughing with my kids. Sometimes mm. they just do the most outlandish shit where I'm about to get angry. And then I stop for a second and then I just start laughing. Cause it's like, what That's, the fuck, man? that That's, is so key, dude. Like, That's actually like, uh, something that we kind of have been like doing in our ritual more often. Like, well, we, yeah, yesterday, for example, I remember you saying the power of laughter. Sometimes, sometimes, like, like, sometimes reality is just so like hard to deal with or absurd. But when you laugh at the it, the only thing you can do is laugh. That's right. It, cha- it changes your relationship with it too. It becomes like the it, this thing that seems like like we would share stories that are like, oh, that sucks, and we'd laugh. I'd, I'd find myself just non-stop laughing at my buddy tom like telling a story that is like so, it's, yeah. it's just like the Dude, we're, we're up we're up stuff. we're up here in this like up on this piece of land where there's like this trail that goes by so there's like these snowmobiles that are going by and we're just laughing like so hard because it's just so real and so true like we can connect to what he's saying so much and these these snowmobiles are going by and like they're looking over at us probably like well, these fools just laughing but like whatever man that's that's the beauty of it right yeah well i remember i remember like a couple of years ago or something i i heard about like these people would go up on stage and tell their stories that are it was like laugh laugh therapy and a person would go up and be like i got i just got diagnosed with cancer and the whole all, the whole crowd would laugh at them and it seems so counterintuitive, but after they would feel way more, they would feel more relieved and they would feel better about their situation, you know, yeah. because it's, it's almost like their, their bad experience is giving people uh, enjoyment. And you'd think that would have a negative effect, but it actually has a positive effect that you're, you're bringing joy to other people. Um, I think there's something to that. I mean, Definitely. I, I like that. That's like the best part of or not the best part of a ritual but that's a great part of a ritual and at the end we start la- start talking and just laughing at the absurdity of each other's lives yeah for sure man it, and it is i mean when you look at it from the right angle it is absurd it's ridiculous we're fucking yeah. apes clinging to a freaking <laughs> rock hurtling through space uh, and we've yeah. got all these crazy ideas about things and it's like, you know, the way things ought to be and the way things are, and this is the truth and you're immoral, you're evil and I'm good. And it's like, are you fucking kidding me? You're an ape. It's it. Yeah. It's, it's, it's all ideas. And it's all, it's all sh- yeah. bullshit or something, but Absolutely. Um, we were talking about the, the, the ice age yesterday or the other day in our ritual. And Ryan was like, yeah, they had to like live in this snow. Like that they just, did that like native americans you know and uh so i don't remember i can't remember i shouldn't even try to bring it up but i think tom goes but but how do they how do they cook things (laughs) ryan's like they made fires and i'm go i'm like uh, they didn't have no easy bake oven. Like the absurdity that they were living in ice age and there was, they had to make fires to to today's present that you could, that there's literally a thing called an easy bake oven. Like it just, it blew my mind in the moment and it just made me laugh. Yeah, it's crazy. It's it's an absolute insanity, but it's good good to be alive in these days. I mean, rather it than is. in the ice age, right? I mean, I like my you know my microwave and shit. Yeah, yeah. we. I mean, I, I think everybody in today's age has you know has a luxury of being alive today. You know, definitely. Yeah, and so again, back to connection, right? I mean, we have it so easy. Like, you don't have to worry about your next meal or going out to hunt or some tribes rolling up on horseback and in your whole village or whatever right and so you know it's counterintuitive but it seems to me that the standard of living keeps going up quality of life length of life is going up and yet we are more disconnected 
more depressed, more aimless than ever before. So like in your guys' opinion, what's, what, that is a disconnect. Why, why are we so uh, miserable when we have probably the best of everything that all of humankind has ever had? What's the problem? Would, it's a great question. I would say that they're almost, uh, they're more related than you'd think because the more we have ease of access, like ease of living and no have to worry about survivability, the less I have to rely on anyone but myself. Like a single person can live in their apartment and never leave their place and, and live. Right. Back in the day, that's not possible. If you get ostracized from your tribe, you're dead. You know, you yep. can't live on your own back then. That's actually a big reason why social anxiety is ingrained into our DNA. It's something I always struggled with a lot. But uh, that feeling of like being kicked out of your tribe is like, it's the feeling of death. It's like the worst feeling ever because like you're on your own. Hmm. And uh, I mean, as we've like, I, I was thinking about like a, a community that like, let's say, even if it's not like you protect each other from bands of other tribes or from wild animals, but if you all grow you grow food and the food goes to the people in your community, that is relying on each other. You know, <laughs> if, if uh, you have certain jobs within this community, like you're still relying on each other for sustenance, for survivability, for connection. And that has, I think has been eroded away. Yeah. Um, till the modern day, we don't really rely on each other for anything. We, re we rely on big corporations to, you know, fill the, the grocery aisles and, and, and whatnot. And, and the problem with that is that they're profiting off of us getting richer and we're getting, I'm not, not to get like economics. on. No, it, get it, get, get into it, man. I love it. I love it all. It, I talk about all this stuff. It's all connected, it's, right? You can't have yeah. spirituality without politics. You can't you tell me that you're, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not political. Like that's a political statement, right? And so yeah, people, yeah. I've met a lot of people in this sort of circle, you know, uh, let's call it the spiritual circle or the mystical circle that are like above politics or they're like, you know, whatever I'm enlightened. Yeah, yeah. It's like, well, it <laughs> doesn't yeah, sound yeah. like it to me because if you're right. enlightened, you're going to take an interest in what's happening to your fellow human beings who are merely uh, aspects of the same being as you, you guys are all one. It's the same person experiencing itself in different bodies. So how can you not care about politics? How can you not I care about people starving and being you know, bombed by uh, wealthy nations and all this stuff? Like, you know, to me, that's the opposite of becoming spiritual. Yeah, I love that you have that point of view. And it, I think Ryan, like early on when I, after the psychedelics would always tell me like, he's like, it's, it doesn't, I don't know. He would just always ground me whenever I would get kind of too much, too, too up, like in that type of realm of, of thinking and stuff. He'd be like, look, you don't, oh yeah, we, we would always, we, would, well, we had this conversation about like gurus or, or, you know, people in the limelight who are telling people how to live and stuff. And it's like, you know, telling people how to deal with their emotions and like that's awesome i love it it's great but like ultimately is that what we want to do is do we want to look up to one person mm -hmm. and be like we have to do everything that this person is telling us i don't know um it was just a conversation we used to have so whenever you know ryan would always kind of ground me and be like look you got to look to yourself it's not about looking up to other people even though there's great advice um well i mean like you said if we're all uh which I believe that we're all the same thing experiencing itself in different ways. Like ultimately whatever someone else has access to, you know, this guru, I have access to that within too. And coming from within, it will always be more powerful mm. than coming from externally. hundred percent. Yeah. And I mean, the role of those gurus and those religious texts and all that stuff is merely to point out what's already within you and help yeah. you get there because it's not as easy as like going into your living room and grabbing something out of the cupboard or whatever, right? Like going within in and of itself, is something that most people are like, the fuck does that mean? How do I go within, right? Because it's you're not actually going anywhere. You're going into here. But so I think that there's value in some of those systems and some of those gurus, but I uh, couldn't agree with you more. The moment you put 100% of your trust, faith, and uh, you let these people dictate what you're going to believe and what you're going to do without any critical thought, you're lost in my personal opinion. Like you got to keep your critical thinking alive and you got to keep your eyes open. Um, because yeah, anybody is, everybody's fallible, you know, to some extent. Did you, um, I don't know if you checked it out, but we just uploaded a video to our channel, um, a couple of days ago, we interviewed, um, a psychologist, Dr. Mm -hmm. Rick Barnett. Um, he's local too. He lives in Vermont and, uh, well, I don't, I mean, it was a great conversation, but that we started talking about this guy, Dr. Carl Hart, who is very progressive in the, and one of his things is like, 
uh, Dr. Carl Hartz thinks is like you can get enlightened or you can get a mystical experience from any any drug, any substance. It doesn't, you know, he, he, he I guess he has this thing like psychedelic elitism. He doesn't really <laughs> think psychedelics should be. You he, know, he's a super interesting guy. He wrote a book. Uh, he just published it. It's uh, drug use for adults for, or drug use for grownups. Yeah. And he talks about he, he's a, on a chair of psychology at like Columbia and mm. He's he came out and said he's been using heroin recreationally for the past five years. And like, I don't think that's a great idea to, to do, but I condone him for like showing that it's not about the drug. It's about the relationship. Um, and I yep. think that's an important thing, you know? And like, for me, it's like, I don't want to rely on any substance externally, but if a substance can help, uh accentuate your sober life then they can be valuable tools and for me psychedelics and cannabis have been that and uh in my own life the other substances have been more destructive like uh alcohol and adderall so it's like learn what works for you develop a relationship but uh i mean when it comes down to that you really just have to be incredibly honest with yourself because yeah. I told myself for a long time that Adderall was helping me. Mm -hmm. I told myself that alcohol was helping me and convinced myself of it. I'm sure you did the same with heroin. Mm -hmm. And well, when it, you, it, I mean, it was helping me for a moment. Yeah. It's not. Yeah. I mean, that's the whole point. Like they are effective. Otherwise we wouldn't be using them, but for where you are right now, yeah. do you want to be using it? No. Do I want to be using that? Absolutely not. So well, it's just like we were saying with the whole uh, nightclub ritual, you know, like effective, yes, but there are certain things that they're effective because they're novel. And then as you keep repeating them every single weekend, they mm -hmm. become destructive, right? And so yeah. what you're saying about heroin makes perfect sense. It was helpful at some point, but it's one of those things that if you just continue down that path, it may become destructive, right? Yeah. I love this. This is, I love these conversations. And I think these need to be talked about like more like the, the, not the normalizing of drugs, but just the de-stigmatization because yeah, I don't know. It's just, I love, I love this, that, that topic. It's yeah. silly, man. It's so it silly is. that, that drugs are illegal. Like yeah. again, decriminalize all of them immediately. There's no point in criminalizing drugs and it's hypocritical anyways, because which drugs, right? Yeah. You're on Adderall. It was prescribed to you by a fucking yeah. doctor. What drugs? Cigarettes are illegal. They kill way more people than cannabis. What Alcohol drugs? Too. Right? Exactly. So let's just be honest. Let's just open the door. Let's decriminalize this shit. And then let's have intelligent conversations about which ones could be legalized and regulated and which ones just kind of stay on the shelf. But at the end of the day, man, I guess I'm a bit of a libertarian at heart because I think that if your actions are not impacting people around you, you're a responsible adult, you should have the right to do whatever the hell you want, right? As long as yeah. it's not breaking my property, hurting somebody else, like why not have a, a, a trip house where you can go with a nursing staff on hand and a doctor oh, yeah. and Absolutely. you can have, not just for medicinal reasons, I want to go on a fucking, you know, Mayan adventure. I want to go and see Panthers. Like, I don't care. I'm an adult. I can do what I want. So sign me up. Let's go on a trip and I want a shaman to guide me. You know, like it doesn't make sense. We're adults, right? That's the whole point. Like we have autonomy and sovereignty. So let us do what we want. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I think, you know, maybe in the future, I, there's something also about like one person doing drugs alone. Yeah. Maybe they're not hurting anyone, but maybe it would be nice if like, if somebody is like that and they're in there isolated, like that's what I worry about. I don't want mm -hmm. someone to be isolated. I want them to have a community of people. Like now I have my brother, I've always had him, but, now I can talk to him about things that I couldn't in the past. And I can talk to like, like I have more of a people that I can talk to. And now what I found for myself, I don't want heroin. So like it, in being more of community based, being more with more people um, I've found within myself, like I don't need that stuff, but it's not to say somebody wouldn't, but at least, you know, don't, you know, I don't, I don't like the, I personally don't like the idea of like being isolated and, and like, yeah, maybe it doesn't, you know, I don't know. I'm just, I really like the idea of community. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and again, if you decriminalize it, you can have more support so that people aren't disconnected and on their own because now all of a sudden they're not criminals so they can yeah. seek help. Right. And there maybe you, you know, you save some money decriminalizing drugs. So maybe you could reinvest some of that uh, into communities, helping people mm -hmm. become more connected because like right at the very beginning of that Ted talk, he sent me, you know, the, he cites the rat park experiment. I mean, this is exactly what we're talking about boys. 
you know, the rats were doing Coke because they were by themselves and they had nothing else to do. Of course, they're going to drink the Coke water. I mean, but as soon as you give them friends and shit to do, all of a sudden it's like, no, it's just a thing and it doesn't uh, consume them anymore, right? Yeah, and that like played itself out with the Vietnam War as well. I I don't know if you mentioned that. I think you did. Yeah, they all came back and they all kind of kicked it and everything was fine, right? Because they reconnected with their their communities and stuff. And yeah, Yeah. it makes perfect sense. But as long as we're, um, yeah, anyways. What boggles my mind about that is like that those studies were 30, 40 years ago, pretty much, you know, showing definitively what helps with addiction. And yet we're still trying to treat addiction by putting 99% of resources into maintenance drugs, maintenance drugs like methadone. It's almost like in the rat park experiment, if they were to add another bottle laced with methadone and be like, if they drink that, that's a success. If they don't touch the other one. (laughs) it's so fucking Ugh. like backwards, but it, so that's backwards. like, that's like the way we were, we were going about it. Instead of like treating the, the setting, creating yeah. more avenues for connection, we're trying to maintain their, 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 their problem instead of cure it in a way. Absolutely. Yeah, so like, and if there's like one thing that anybody can, can take away from my life and Ryan's mm-hmm. life, like anything at all, like minimal take away that, like, it's pr- like, we're pr- like, Ryan has proved, like I've, I'm trying to show people at least I'm not trying to show anyone. I'm trying to show myself really. And Ryan's trying to show himself, but what we've managed to do, the fact of what we're doing, like the connection is at the heart of everything, like um, community connection, people. I never thought I was going to get off opiates. I never did. I was ready. I was prepared to die doing it. Like that's ultimately what my, my choice, like my decision, like, subconsciously was i'm gonna die this way and this is how i want to die don't don't tell me i can't and i was on it for a long time 10 years but um within i had this you know psychedelic experience which was definitely very connecting in the sense that i the way i took it and just that's for me it was extreme and it was mystical i guess and i think also you know it was coming from me um me telling you my experience with the psychedelics me telling you all these studies and like it wasn't just about the substance. It was about the connection from the beginning. You mm-hmm. know? Yeah, absolutely. I don't talk that, about that enough, but that's true. Like you, we had, yeah, in-depth conversations about it. Um, but like, I, so I take the psychedelic, like I get this connecting uh, experience and then, okay, now I'm like ready to go, but I'm still on a high dose of methadone. And, but, but w- within three months I get off of it and now it's been, you know, coming up on a year pretty soon here in April, it'll be a year that I've been clean from opiates. And uh, to me, it's not, I'm not like, Oh my God, I'm going to get one year. Like, yeah, I'll, I'll celebrate it. And I'll, I'll make like a post maybe on like social media just to like congratulate myself. But like, um, you know, I, I don't think of it as like, Oh my God, it's a year, you know, I, just cause I don't want to put like huge expectations on it. Right. But there's, it's nothing short of a miracle the fact of like what's going on right now in my life and so i'm grateful every day it's still difficult but i'm more grateful than i've been in a while and again yeah. i think chatting with both of you guys what really struck me is that you know you have rory this like you know pretty incredible story right i mean 10 years on opiates and all this kind of stuff and you know uh, what you've done is is incredible but at the same time you know ryan you didn't have the same sort of situation, but you also had problems. You also had depression and substance abuse issues. And so it's like, what I get out of you guys in some ways is that everybody has something that they're dealing exactly. with. Everybody's exactly. got something. And some, you know, subjectively, you might think this, this is worse than that or whatever. Heroin's worse than Adderall, whatever. It doesn't matter because the person going through it to them, that's, that's the matters. fucking world ending painful suffering exactly. bullshit and so you can't compare all you can uh, kind of know is that everybody's got something on the go right yeah and, and i yeah i just want to i wanted to say like i don't well, i don't want like people watching this or whatever like my even my, for myself i'm not like i may use my my past as like leverage to be like look it is possible but i'm not saying what i've gone through is any more miraculous than what the next person's gone through at all, whatsoever I think everybody has just as much issues, if not like, you know, my idea on struggle and all that stuff, I think pretty much everybody has the same level of struggle on some level, like the deepest, the deepest, I think everybody does. But um, yeah, I don't know, I guess 
just because opiates in this society are looked at so poorly and so negatively, I, I can use, you know, my past to, to try to inspire others, but it's not about, oh, I, I'm better or I did it better than anyone. I mean, if it wasn't for Ryan doing what he did, I wouldn't be here. So I mean, about the connections, man. It's yeah, no, and and I'm not trying to, again, I'm not trying to minimize anything. Like I, again, I think it's incredible. And and specifically for the reasons that you brought forth, I mean, I live in, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, but like Mm. the, the number of opiate deaths, um, is shattering records. Like we have people overdosing on fentanyl, like every day, hundreds of people. Like I I don't have the statistics, but like, so I'm, and and I have a friend who came out of of prison after a lengthy, uh, stint. So through him, I've met a lot of people in the sort of uh, community and it's bad, man. It's a scourge. It's killing people. And so it's no fucking joke. And the fact that you were able to, again, with support, with help through these different sort of, uh, events that occurred, um, to work your way out of that is, yeah, man, that's a story worth sharing. I just think that every story has some of those types of insights. And so like, I'm just so thrilled that I get to like chat with you guys because they're all, they're all worthwhile stories and they all have value. And I think that anybody listening will get a ton of stuff out of these types of conversations, man, like beneficial stuff. So, I mean, yeah, it's, I think everyone should share their story because you learn a lot about yourself and sharing a story and everyone, like Rory said, everyone, every human has to deal with the hardest struggles of life. The, the questions of, you know, life of what to do with your life of death of connection. Like, like, I mean, one other thing I want to say is like people talk about psychedelics as a panacea, but I wouldn't say psychedelics are, I would say connection is though connect deep connection and purpose is a panacea to mental illness and all your problems. Really. Um, it, it makes those problems valuable. Like instead of just like taking care of my depression, it made the depression a valuable thing in my life. It made Rory's addiction a valuable thing in his life that yeah. that impacts it has an impact now in this moment, a positive one. Yeah. It's alchemy, man. It That's is, alchemy, man. man. You take some shitty tin and you turn it into gold, right? You take a you know addiction and you turn it into uh, again a message of hope and connection for the rest of the world. And man, love chat with you guys. It's so good. Um, yeah. Any any parting words that you guys want to share before we log off? Because I got to go grab some dinner with the kiddos. I just want to say thank you so much. I, it, it, this has been an amazing experience talking with you. Yeah, um, 100%. Sharing, I feel like I gained more clarity on my story, on Rory's story. And mm-hmm. I feel like the connection I made with you is uh, super positive And just I'm excited for the rest of this week after this I guess this talk, you know? It's like that feeling of just... Yeah, man, absolutely. i uh so grateful that you reached out to us, like... I love it. And I'm checking out stuff on your channel and man, you've got some great insight. You've got some wonderful views, point of views. And um, I love what you're doing. And I saw, I saw the one that you did with uh, Gary Haskins. That guy is awesome. We talked to him too. Yeah. I can't wait to see you guys on there. Yeah. I keep track of, I mean, I, I, think, I keep track of all you guys, uh, <laughs> but so I, awesome. I always save like a, you guys put a new one out and I'm like, watch later. Right. And then when I go in the sauna, I'm like, you up the videos listen to you guys but uh yeah, Gary's like, a good dude i was thinking like maybe in the future sometime like all four of us could have a talk i don't know it's just like an idea but um yeah uh, dude I, I if you guys are open to different ideas i got lots man i think that we could do some amazing stuff together not just the three of us but yeah like gary and there's some other people that you guys have run into that i've run into as well and i think there's potential there to create something that mm-hmm. again to cultivate more of those connections